Welcome to Dead Folks Tales, a New Orleans-centric podcast exploring Southern Gothic stories, history, and hauntings with your host, paranormal and fantasy author, Nola Nash. Find out more at nolanash.com. Now, let's talk about dead people. Welcome to the show. I'm so glad that you're with us tonight. And if you are watching us live, feel free to drop those comments into the comment section wherever you are watching. We'll keep an eye on those and try to get to some of your questions if they happen to appear there for us and we've got time to answer them. Otherwise, if you're watching after the fact, any of the recorded shows or if you are listening to the podcast, please post those comments. We do check those out as well. So we are glad to have you, whether you're watching live or listening to us in the audio podcast. So thank you so much for for joining us for Dead Folks Tales. I am excited tonight because we are going to talk about short stories. And as a novelist, short stories are something that intimidate me. So does poetry, because I am used to having many, many chapters to develop a story, to develop characters, to do all of those things that these phenomenal short story writers manage to do in just a few pages. So I am a huge fan of short stories, and especially this time of year. Um, as an English teacher for years, I have taught those great creepy stories, The Landlady by Roald Dahl, uh, lots of Edgar Allan Poe. And I'm just a sucker for a, a well-written, a great short story. So I'm excited to have Jim Lambert joining me today. And Jim, go ahead. And for our listeners and our viewers who don't know who you are, go ahead and tell them a little bit about yourself, please. Well, I'm a native of Louisiana. I, I grew up in uh, central Louisiana. And uh, some, some and quite a few of the stories are based there. Uh, I was also lived in New Orleans uh, for a while, where I started practicing law. I met my wife down there. Um, and uh, am a resident primarily in the last several decades in Lafayette um, in the Cajun country. And uh, mm -hmm. I have always had a, an admiration for writers. And I, I think uh, many lawyers in their heart would love to be a writer. And uh, when I retired, I, you know, it was uh, kind of like the old saying, you know, uh, if not now, when, you know, and if not who who than you, you know, and yes. um, it was either, as they say in central Louisiana, uh, you know, fish or cut bait. And so mm -hmm. uh, I uh, found a great uh, editor, Val Matthews in Athens, Georgia, and uh, she helped me work on the stories for a couple of years. And um, I released this collection, Sub Rosa and Other Stories in January. And uh, I'm pleased to say it's gotten some good reviews from uh, the Kirkus people and um, uh, some local newspapers. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to get it out to more people and hopefully uh, share this. It's just a part of a, a creative act that I, I wanted to do. Now, your short stories are very creative. You've got some interesting characters that are part of your stories and having so little space in you know, the number of words and the number of pages, what is one of your challenges for developing those characters and making sure that they, that your readers understand them and, and really get them in that kind of short space that you have? How do you attack that and make sure that they, they come to life the way that you want them to? Well, all my stories kind of start with some nugget. Some, and it's usually something I see. Uh, I've heard a little bitty story or part of a story that someone has told me and it just it, it, there's an emotional anchor there, you know, that kind of I can build a story around and then, uh, you know, the voice of the of the narrator, whether it's a, a first person or, you know, maybe a, a, dispass a more dispassionate third person. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to, you know, get that voice and and find a, a true voice. And um, when you do that, I think you can uh, create a story with uh, kind of an economy of words. You know, you're intimidated by short stories. I, I'm intimidated by novels, you know, <laughs> the idea of writing a novel. But, uh, you know, we have, uh, I think, 12 or 13 stories in this collection. And uh, I guess it ends up being about the same as, you know, in terms of pages but uh mm. i've always enjoyed stories i'm like you in english class uh, we read the great stories it was a genre that was very more dominant back in the 30s the 40s um 
and, and, and before that even. And uh, the novel now, of course, is, is the dominant literary genre. Uh, short stories really should be, in my opinion, very popular today because of people's uh, demands on their time and attention mm-hmm. span and so forth. You can sit down and read one in 20, 30, 40 minutes or an hour and then go to sleep, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the next one. Absolutely. I mean, I remember, I mean, the, you know, of course, teaching things like Poe and and those short stories. But in school, Rudyard Kipling and all of these great stories that you really could dive into, digest in that short period of time and walk away with a full experience. And yes. it's that magic when that happens kind of like with poetry. I'm incredibly intimidated by having to harness an emotion or harness a, a moment in time in so few words and really communicate it effectively. It's the same thing with a short story that I love that you said the economy of words. That's a great way to put it mm-hmm. because as a teacher, I've always said, you know, every word matters. The author of this short story agonized over word choice. So let's, let's not discount that and, and, you know, not really carefully examine how they constructed that sentence, how they built that scene, because there is so much craft that goes into a short story. It, it's a I, I, I fear that people discount because it's short, the amount of work that really goes into getting a good short story right. And mm-hmm. that's something that, you know, even, even though I can't write them, I am such a champion of because I understand that. As a writer, as you're sitting down and, and working on this, do you find yourself editing down a longer story and kind of pulling those details and and refining as you go? Or do you have that nugget that then you're kind of finding that sweet spot of, of, of more kind of fleshing out that, that particular moment in time or that particular emotion that you're trying to convey? Is it, is it a growing process or a shrinking process? Is it right in that right perfect length for you? Um, I, I think probably more for me a growing process, you know, uh, you know, the, it's kind of like, you know, and my process is for pretty slow. A lot of people will write a story in a, a couple of days and, uh, and, and it varies, you know, I mean, I've had some that just spilled out, but um, I, I don't write, you know, a 25 page story and, tr- and then edit it down to, you know, 10 pages or something like that. Um, many of the literary journals these days want really short stories. They want 2,500 words, you know, seven, six or seven That's pages. So short. It's very short. They really want super short stories. And, uh, you know, so, you know. That's like Reader's Digest short. <laughs> Those very, were short stories. Yes, I, I'm telling you that a lot of the, the more modern literary journals want that. And um, I, I, I have a few that I uh, constructed like that, uh, kind of a few that are kind of a, kind of an experimental form. Some of them don't have characters. Mm-hmm. Some of them don't have dialogue. You know, I, I'm just trying to do some different things. I got some ideas from Joyce Carol Oates and one of the listening to her master class and uh, decided to, oh, let's try this, you know, and uh, it was kind of fun. So you have chosen, and we're talking about dead people here. We're going to talk about the Jim Crow. You and I talked about Jim Crow laws. And an interesting thing that, you know, speaking about Alexandria, Louisiana, being where you're from, and not a lot of people know a whole lot about Alexandria, Louisiana. You know, when people think, you know, outside of the state and outside of that region, it seems to be New Orleans is what we all gravitate to. Everybody's Mm -hmm. mind goes to, New Orleans, the surrounding river parishes and the plantations and everything down there. But there was a lot of history, especially Civil War history and then after Mm -hmm. that happened all over the state. And it wasn't always pretty. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a whole lot that perhaps was was hidden. And you came across some things that were hidden that then went on to inspire you. Yes. uh, There's two major incidents that uh, um, that led to two stories of mine. Um, one was a, a 
Colfax uh, massacre that occurred in 1873 during Reconstruction. And um, essentially, uh, there, there was a big fight over an election. And uh, three white militia units surrounded a courthouse full of uh, black Republican troops. And, um, you know, it, there was a battle on Easter Day. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, 100, you know, there's a plaque outside the court, pl co Colfax courthouse until about three months ago. It stood from 1950 until about three months ago. And it celebrated, you know, the, the great victory. <laughs> and they called it a Colfax riot uh, where, you know, three whites and 150 Negroes were killed. And, uh, wow. you know, it, it said it, this marked the beginning of the end of carpetbag misrule in the South. And uh, it was erected by the state of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw that about 15 years ago and I, I, I was taking some pictures. And I had never, what? I've never heard of this thing. And um, I started doing some research. It was a major thing in 1873. President Grant sent troops down here. Um, there was a U.S. Supreme Court decision, a major decision about the 14th Amendment. And nothing appeared in our Louisiana history books about this. Nothing. And, um, you know, another sad incident, a very sad incident occurred uh, seven weeks after Pearl Harbor in Alexandria. Uh, uh, this was a, Alexandria was surrounded by major training bases in World War II. And, um, there was a, a section for Negro troops to come and there were bars and theaters and things like this. And, you know, a huge fight broke out of some type and about 80 police officers just opened up on uh, unarmed Negro troops wearing the, 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 you know, army uniforms and as many as 18 men were killed. And uh, this was hushed up. And uh, there was a report by the army that, oh, yes, some troops were wounded, but no one was killed. Everything's, in, you know, back to normal. They did not want this out to the Nazis or to the Japanese at this point. It was only seven weeks after Pearl Harbor, and uh, it, was, it would have been a propaganda disaster. But I had heard about this, rumors about this as a boy coming up, and um, I started looking into it, and, and luckily... The historian had really done some great work in the Louisiana Historical Quarterly. And uh, so I built a story around uh, an investigation of this, a fictional investigation uh, called, and the story is called Report to Mrs. Roosevelt. But, um, you know, both these stories are, you know, I, I like to, to write about historical, uh, you know, I put words into the mouths of you know, dead people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but trying to be faithful to history, but, um, you know, imagining what we don't have, you know, imagining Mrs. Roosevelt really wanted an investigation of this, which I think she probably did. And, and an appeal was made by bl black ministers in Alexandria to the White House to do that. So, you know. It's an interesting take on these stories that are that have been intentionally buried to then dig yeah. them back up again and give them voice. And right. I, I really love especially that that niche there, that that mm -hmm. very unique location, that very unique story. Yeah. You know, you, you spoke about that nugget that you just kind mm -hmm. of latch on to. And what a fascinating nugget mm -hmm. to be able to expand then and take that moment and mm -hmm. turn that into that creative fiction and that short story. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. How do you feel like those stories have been has been received? Have people been amazed to find out that these things actually happened? That that was that was actually history and not just something yeah. that was created by yeah. the author? Sure. Uh, yes, they have. I mean, I wish I could say the the book was a huge bestseller and you know thousands. Don't of we all? <laughs> <laughs> You know, but uh, yes, uh, I think, you know, it's very timely. I mean, it's, you know, we have all this discussion right now of critical race theory and, you know, uh, the, the objections to critical race theory remind me of a, of a quote that I heard about, attributed to Harry Truman. And uh, he said, you know, those Republicans say I give them hell. I don't give anybody hell. 
I just tell the truth and they think it's hell. Wow. And it's uh, an interesting quote. It's a great quote. And I mean, what we're doing is bringing this, this truth forward. You know, uh, the book, I don't know if you are aware of the great book, um, uh, written by Isabel Wilkerson, Cast. Mm -hmm. It's probably the best book on on uh, on race and, and the establishment, essentially, of a caste system in America for the last 400 years. And uh, it is, a, she she's won, already won the Pulitzer Prize in the past, and I suspect she'll probably win it for that book. But uh, it was a fantastic book. And these books bringing forth the history you know, the great monument now, I mean, the work that's being done by the Equal Justice Initiative, I don't know if you're aware of the great uh, memorial in Montgomery, Alabama to lynching. And that is a, if you've never been there, to our, our, our viewers, it is, it, is, it is as powerful as the Vietnam Memorial or the 9-11 Memorial. Wow. It is, a, it is an, truly an amazing thing. They've got a museum called the Legacy Museum about Jim Crow and slavery. And I learned things I had no idea. I thought I knew some stuff before I started reading and learning. And uh, I've got a lot, lot, lot more to learn probably, but, you know. Absolutely. I mean, there's so much that we can learn from mm -hmm. all. And it's, gr it's great that there are people willing to bring those things to light and willing yeah. to to tell the stories of those whose voices have been silenced. Yeah. And there are so many different people out there from, you know, I, mm -hmm. I love the work that, that so many people are pushing forward for, you know, a, women who have been abused that have been silenced over the past and their voices coming to light, yep. um, indigenous people, African-Americans, you know, so many voices that are yep. coming into literature and yep. really bringing together such a, a beautifully woven tapestry of stories. Yep. And what a great way to, to find those nuggets that are in your own backyard mm -hmm. that maybe you know you didn't even know about that and, and that's where you yeah. grew up and then there yeah. it is there's a story to exactly. be told and to take mm -hmm. that and to tell that story and bring that fiction um with that historical truth in it makes it so much mm -hmm. more accessible to people than you know here's the plaque on the courthouse here read the plaque there it is no yeah. bring yeah. that to life so that you read, the, can appreciate you read it the plaque and you go what the hell that's that can't be a riot <laughs> That can be right. <laughs> 150 and three. Come on, you know, and it's absurd. It's absurd, really. But um, anyway, a lot of absurd. Now, tell us. Oh, you had some. Um, you have some excerpts, and I would love for you to choose one of those that you would like to read for us. Um, again, as you're listening, folks, it is all about word choice. It is mm -hmm. about how you you create this tale to be told in a short space, every word matters. So mm -hmm. what would you like to share with us, Jim? Well, I saw, of course, on your website, your great love for the city of New Orleans. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, again, we're gonna have a little hidden history uh, of, about New Orleans. Um, it may be that many people don't understand or realize that Lee Harvey Oswald lived in New Orleans. He, his, his family was from New Orleans and he was born, I think he was born in New Orleans, but he definitely lived there for a number of years as, as a young man, as a child, uh, as well as other cities. He lived in New York City for a while and Dallas for a while, but um, he, he went to junior high and high school, I think briefly, and, and then he went into the Marines. But um, this is a little story, uh, called Lee and Me, and um, it's it's written, uh, you know, from the perspective of uh, a young man who is a friend of Lee Harvey Oswald. And I'll just read the very, uh, you know, beginning of this. Uh, they kind of get into some escapades. They go in around the French Quarter, where, where Lee actually lived in, on Exposition Place. Teenagers he had in the French Quarter. That, <laughs> it's never a good thing. Teenagers in the French Quarter and at an Elvis concert in Pont Strain B. So, oh, wow. Uh, so, and, and all of these things ha actually happen around the same time. I've been but, to Pontchartrain uh, Beach. That's funny to think that I have been to Pontchartrain Beach and Lee Harvey Oswald was at Pontchartrain Beach. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was, well, we don't know that for sure. We don't know for sure. Well, I bet he did. In this story, he did. So, uh, here we go. 
you know him as Lee Harvey Oswald, the crazy assassin who killed President John F. Kennedy. We just called him Lee. I met him in 1954 on the corner of King Street and Jefferson Davis Parkway in New Orleans. We were on what is called the neutral ground. That's the land between the traffic lanes on big boulevards. I've never figured out why they call it neutral ground because there wasn't anything neutral about it. It was more of a battleground, boys and men fighting all the time. Lee and me, we met during a fight. A bunch of us ninth graders were hanging out at the playground and five hoods from Warren Eastern High School came up and jumped us. It was about eight or nine of us, but those boys were older and one of them wrapped his belt around his fist and started wailing away on Lee. Lee was a skinny kid, just assigned to my homeroom class. I felt sorry for him. I grabbed a fallen limb from one of the live oaks and whacked that hood upside his head. He fell off Lee just long enough for the two of us to take off running toward Bayou St. John a few blocks away. The hoods took out after us. The boy with the belt looked like a charging bull with crazy eyes and a little streak of blood coming from his ear. As we neared the bayou, I yelled to Lee, I'm Murray, what's your name? Lee, thanks for helping. What the hell are we gonna do? We both stood breathless on the bank of the bayou as the hoods drew nearer. Can you swim, I yelled. We gotta, we gotta swim the bayou. Let's go. We dove into Bayou St. John and started swimming for the other side. The hood stopped at the water's edge. We made it across the dark green water and ran towards City Park, where we hid in some thick bushes until after sunset. Lee looked at me and smiled. Man, you saved my ass. I owe you. Why'd you do it? Those guys could have killed both of us. I don't know. I just reacted. I, I saw that limb. I always take up for the underdog. There, among the bushes, we traded our histories, as short as they were at the time. Lee's daddy died before he was born. He and his mom had moved around a lot, just returned from a stint in New York where he got thrown in the can as a juvenile delinquent. The two now lived in a tiny apartment in the French Quarter above a pool hall on Exchange Alley. He told me he could get me into the pool hall because his uncle knew the owner. He could teach me some pool shots and how to throw darts. He seemed like a cool kid, the kind I wanted to get to know, especially the part about the pool hall. I never met a real juvenile delinquent. Never met a real juvenile delinquent. <laughs> oh, but what his future has in store. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a great, I love the perspective from the friend who's who's getting yeah. to know Lee in this way. Right. And that I think is a great perspective for the readers too, because in many mm. ways, young Lee Harvey Oswald is not the one that we know. And so yeah. it is it's Just, interesting to understand his teenage years as well in that fictional context. Just a kid, you know, and um, you know, I mean you'd be surprised what you can find reading the you know, the Warren report, Warren Commission reports, it's amazing all the stuff they, unbelievable amount of background in there. And uh, I kind of got into reading some of that. It was just, wow. It's fascinating yeah. stuff. And speaking of your research, uh, Denise Burt, who is a friend of the show, friend of mine, God love Denise. Thank you for joining us tonight, Denise, and posting your question for us. Um, she's looking forward to reading your work, James, uh, James, Jim, because you are a new author to her. But she had a question for you about your research process. So mm -hmm. has there been something in particular, something that stood out that perhaps was the most fascinating or surprising thing during your research process, either about Lee Harvey Oswald or just any of the things that you have been researching lately? Um, I know you, you discovered the, you know, the story that we were just talking about before mm -hmm. and then Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, you have a lot of things that you have researched for these stories. What yeah. perhaps has been the most surprising or fascinating part? Well, I have to go back, you know, it always, you know, goes back to the original sin of, of America, which is slavery, and, and it goes all the way through. And uh, I think what really was really surprising to me was reading about the racial violence that occurred during World War II. 
you know. Uh, it it was, seems so <laughs> recent, you know. Was, I mean, we don't think about that at the time. But we, yeah, we know. We think everybody was patriotic and mm -hmm. pulling together, and we're gonna beat the, you know, these bad guys and fight for democracy and freedom. And you know, they were there were murders, there were riots, there were, you know, soldiers. Black soldiers were killed in a number of places. There were some of them were lynched at Fort Benning. You know, and, wow. you know I mean, there uh, in 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 Mobile, Alabama. You know, there was a shortage of workers, and and the shipyard, you know, I guess was asked by the federal government to hire some some black workers, and there was a unbelievable. The whites went crazy, and they had to call troops in to restore. Yeah. Workers. yeah so. This is going on in the United States uh, at the same time we're prosecuting a war. I think that was one of the, you know, the saddest uh, uh, points of research that I, I found. Um, but I mean, I, 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 you know, I do have, a, you know, I like to do research uh, as a lawyer. I've been a, was a lawyer for forty three years and. Uh, or however many, 44 years, something like that, who's counting? And, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, research was fun. I mean, you know, most of the time we spent talking on the phone, but, uh, you know, when you could actually get in the library and dig in and do some research, it, it could be fun, even legal research. And um, so I, I, I love the process. And, um, you know, it, now, of course, we've got so much available on the Internet. It's just, it's just unbelievable. And, I find uh, myself in rabbit holes. If I if I linger too long, mm -hmm. boy, yeah. I have a hard time pulling myself back out of the research. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Jim, we could talk for hours about things that you've yeah. got going on, the research that you've done. Uh, you and I have had some fascinating conversations before the show, um, yeah. getting to know yeah. each other as well. So, mm -hmm. great stuff that mm -hmm. you have drawn from in these stories. I, I hope that folks pick up the book. I hope that mm -hmm. they um, get to know you a little better and these stories because short stories are a great, great platform mm -hmm. I, to tell those important little micro moments in time. And, yeah. and I really, I really hope people understand the craft that goes mm -hmm. into writing short stories. So I am in awe of that. And I thank you so much for sharing your craft with us, your history with us, your stories with us. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you so much joining me on this show. Let folks know how they can find you online as well. Well, I have a website. It's jameslambertauthor.com. Um, and um, I'm on And the Facebook. link is in the description for this show. Yes. So folks can go click mm -hmm. that as well and find you there. Yeah. And yes. the book is on Amazon. All, all the platforms, iBooks, um, you know, Books a Million, et cetera. Uh, it's a very good price for digital, three ninety nine. dollars uh, nice, You know, nice. I, you can't get much for three ninety nine. You get maybe. I'm not sure you, you can a, get a coffee for that anymore. <laughs> yeah, get a Big Mac for that. I don't know, you know, a Coke. I mean, you know, so you can buy my book for the price of a large Coke. How about that? Or a go. very <laughs> fancy coffee, you know, and uh but I've enjoyed it. You're very kind. Uh, uh, comments appreciate it very much. And um, and I, I thank you for the opportunity to try to let people know uh, a little bit more about my book. And um, I have just, I'm just doing something creative after 40 years as a lawyer. You know, I want to do something different. And um, this is part of it. I'm so glad that you shared your stories with everyone and that you found that creative outlet. And yep. it's been an absolute delight getting to know you. And I hope Thanks. folks will check out the book. Um, great stories in there. And, you know, guys, go find those short stories and appreciate them for the work that goes into them, just like you would a novel that you would pick mm -hmm. up by your favorite author. And go find some great characters nestled in those pages because they yep. are definitely there. And Jim, thank you so much thank for you. joining no us. All and right. thank you all for That's joining us for this episode. Best of, best of luck with your, your work as oh, well. Thank you so much. And best of luck with the book. I hope that you have just wild success and <laughs> hopefully some more of those little nuggets will find you. So you have more stories to tell as well. I got a couple cooking right now. Thank yes. you. Yes.
awesome. Well, definitely let me know when those are, are going. I would love to hear about those as well. All right, folks, until next time. Good night. Dead Folks Tales is a copywritten podcast of authors on the air, Global Radio Network. Special thanks to producer Roman Surratton and executive producer Pam Stack. Join us next week for another episode of Dead Folks Tales. Thank you.